All right, hey, before we get into today's show, we want to talk about the presenting sponsor, Miller Lite. Chief, tell us a little bit about Miller Lite. I love Miller Lite. So now we're fully into baseball season. The draft is over. All I want to do is reach into an ice cold cooler, grab out that beautiful white can, great tasting, less filling. Miller Lite's the absolute best. Dave? Yeah, it's baseball season. I don't go to baseball games anymore, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean I am no longer drinking Miller Lite. It doesn't have to be at a baseball game. It could be for any. Uh, you want to you want to tell the guy who's sitting on his cooler, like if you're sitting around a fire, somebody's on the cooler. Hey, hey, hey why don't you stand up, grab me a Miller Lite, yeah, toss it over here. Toss, that is the, the best feeling in the world. And you get to catch it, and a little bit of water comes off of it from being in the cooler. It's awesome, and that's the beer that tastes like beer. It's for Dave. What is it? It's Americana. It's Americana. It's Americana. I show that about catching Americana. a beer. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Especially a nice Miller nice Lite. Yep. Splash with the condensation and mm -hmm. the water from the cooler. Old school can. Uh, so till kickoff comes around again, enjoy the beer that tastes like the season. Miller Lite, great taste, 96 calories. To get Miller Lite delivered right to your door, visit MillerLite.com slash Redline. Or you could pick up some Miller Lite pretty much anywhere that they sell beer. It's Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. We're finally supposed to have some nice weather. I'm going to throw something on on the smoker and just sit out back with a Miller Lite and just watch it cook all day long. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, bang, bang. Today is uh, it's it's Thursday. Thursday. It's May 4th. We are uh, doing the mid-show. It's, it's myself, White Sox Dave. Chief Danny, how about some excitement hey, here? How about some excitement? Well, I thought that was exciting. Was it? Yeah. What's he pointing at? May the fourth be with you, Ed. Oh, you fucking <laughs> loser! <laughs> loser. <Dude. laughs> he, he is so disgusting. <laughs> disgusted that I just said that. He's like, you're not even a Star Wars guy. I could guy. see the just sheer disappointment just just evaporate from his body. That's kind of like, like your force, your superpowers, getting under people's skin. I, 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 I didn't know what skin. you were gonna do, but. It could have been worse, I guess. Eddie posted the Justin Timberlake meme on April 30th at 11.59 yeah. saying it's going to be May. <laughs> it's going to be May. Um, the mid show is presented by Miller Lite. As we said, uh, big show today. We're going to talk about the NFL draft, the Bears draft in particular. We have a uh, offensive lineman analyst, uh, Brandon Thorne, joining us. We also have a doctor, Dr. Rick Lehman. He's a sports doctor. Fascinating conversation. Yes. Yeah. We talked to him about why the – White Sox are so awfully injured. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple interviews, interview heavy show. But that doesn't mean we're not going to start here with our thoughts on the NFL draft. So we went out to New York for it. Um, listen, I've, there's been time to digest this, and it's you know long gone. Darnell Wright is my guy, right? Mm -hmm. He is my guy. He's our guy. And I'm excited for it. However, as we get into it with Brandon Thorne, you'll hear in about 10, 15 minutes or so, uh, I think there are still concerns about the offensive line, which is interesting because I kind of feel like there's this vibe that we think that we solved it, and I think a lot still has to be seen. We have to see the work first. I don't think it's as much along. as – I don't think it's – go ahead. We, didn't, we don't think that it's solved and it's just going to be some stud unit. I think it's just you got your right tackle. Braxton Jones, Braxton Jones like, like Chief said earlier – well, actually later because it was in the interview. But Chief said that, I mean, from year one to year two, a, a left tackle, a blindside tackle going from southern Utah to the NFL, you should expect to see a jump. He did stay healthy all last year. Then you got the Nate Davis. It's like average offensive line is a huge improvement, and that's with your quarterback that can run yeah. and, and you know, buy, buy plays on his own. I think that's good. And I guess that's kind of where I am on that too. Like we know well, that's the theme that um, – yeah, that this team is going to be able to do. They're going to be able to run the ball. Mm -hmm. So Darnell Wright, powerful guy. Nate Davis, good run blocker. Obviously saw it in Tennessee. Hopefully Cody Whitehair's healthy. He's not, I guess, that type of guy. But then the left side, Jenkins is a mauler, and Braxton Jones is a mauler in the run game. They're going to try to run the ball, and that's going to create play-action opportunities. And I do think having a mobile quarterback mitigates some of that um, yep. maybe left tackle deficiency in the pass game. And then I, I also think Justin Fields taking a step and then also having wide receivers that can get open on time is going to be a big help in that regard too. So I, I, I think it's going to look better in a, in a more cohesive unit this year. And I am, you know, like I'm an optimistic person in general, but I feel like there's, you know, like there's some there there. Like there like there's, there's reason, gen, like a genuine reason to be optimistic about 
what the offense and the personnel looks like this year versus what it looked like oh, last dude, year. That's not even a question. Of course, we're going to yeah. be more optimistic. I'm just saying that people kind of Eddie's con- Debbie, Debbie Downer. Well, I don't think it's a great See, this wallet. Is where it's like we can't have a conversation. We're right? having I a conversation. Mean, well, I, just, nice. I don't think it's the great wall at Dallas. Okay, like I don't. No, think no, that, no. I don't think yeah. so either. But right. like, what's the main important thing for this season to evaluate? Number one, mm-hmm. like I just hope that as we know, our offensive line is going to be much better in run for in run blocking than pass blocking. I just hope that uh, we are in a good enough position where it's not like, oh, well, the line, like we're not, you yeah, know, we're not there yet. We need to be able to evaluate this guy. Totally. It, so, it, it, it's, it's mandatory. Well, and what do you do if he's not that good and the Panthers suck and you end up with the number one pick again? Totally. You're in a tough spot. But I, 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 I think I feel good enough about fields. And if it, if it crashes and burns with him this year, then there is no debate. You take Caleb Williams. Mm-hmm. If you have a pick, if you have the opportunity to do that, because there, to me, there are no ex- more, more excuses for him. You went out and got DJ Moore. Darnell Moon is coming back. You drafted another wide receiver to stretch the field. I think Claypool slotted as a third, you know, third wide receiver specialist is going to be in a good position to have more success after a full year. It's hard to come in mid year, especially with that group. I think he'll be fine. Komet took steps last year. Like they had the, the running game will be will be. I, I everything you read about that Roshan Johnson is just like uh, yeah. what, it's a, what, what a guy. It's amazing. Field, yep. And um, so it's like I think I think the offense or the, the the personnel around Justin Fields will allow you to actually properly evaluate him. And if he can't do it with this group, then he's then he's not the guy. Then we're then we were all wrong last year. But I, I think yeah. he is. And I, think I just the don't want this good. rose-colored lens where, like, we think the offensive line is completely fixed. When we're plugging in a rookie, mm-hmm. um, where where we have an aging white hair at center, who also like maybe that's his best spot. I still vividly remember multiple times, many times actually, when he had trouble with the snap. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Tevin Jenkins gets hurt a lot, and then yep. we're counting on a fifth rounder. I don't know. I'm just just saying like there needs to be a little bit of pause for the people who are like, oh, yeah, where everything offense is, like, ready to go. And that's mm-hmm. that's fair. That's, I that's, think that's where everybody's at. But, like, I, like what I said to start the convo is there is nowhere to go from up. If they're just an average pass blocking, pass pro line, maybe even slightly below average, I think that's going to give you enough to properly evaluate fields. And I think most Bears I fans hope. know that. And I hope. It's and just such – it's just so important. It's yeah. so important. Absolutely. I also I also trust Getsy to – you know, he to, did that great last year. To, he to molded the things up, yeah. and uh, and like that got better as the as the year went along. And like we've talked about, they had that stretch of five games with thirty points or more, with basically nothing around Justin Fields. And now it's like you, they, on paper, they look like at least a middle of the road group of weapons and blockers to me. I mean, they were putting up thirty points. Pretty regularly last year, five with, times in a row. Yeah, yeah. right. In the middle of the season. So yeah. no, no, no. It's it just, it's just, just something I'm, 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 yeah. I'm saying right now before it's a fair gripe. It. Yeah, it is. No, it's, it's not it's, even really a gripe. It's, it's just a, like it's, it's like a concern. Off, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a concern. For. Like that's yeah. something I've always questioned. Like, oh, we need to like. We, we need a right tackle. We need a right tackle mm-hmm. because we have our left tackle. Like, do we really confirm to have our left? Do we know? Like, yeah, he's, he's durable as fuck. We yeah. know that, right? Mm-hmm. Which is big. We, yeah, we, we we liked a lot of what we saw, but at the same time, like, there was still. I, I wonder if they have their right tackle because they didn't think that there was a left tackle in the draft. Like, Paris Johnson was gone. And I wonder if it was that's what it, that's from everything exactly I know. What it was. No, no, no. From everything I know, we were looking solely at right tackles, from what I heard. Right. Because we wanted oh, to oh, then really? trust okay. polls. Then then trust polls because that's that gives you your answer on why you didn't trust yeah, yeah, because and, and, he's yeah. never yeah, played yeah, on yeah, the right and, side. And I think and I'm still in trust polls mode. I just want to point some things out that I think we should, before advocate. we go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, file it away, kind of. Conf- yes. That, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. all I'm doing. Filing it away. Because those are the discussions that I think are fun mm-hmm. rather than like, oh, we got this guy. Like, I like what I see. Because we can go down the list. Like, listen, some other things the Bears did. Uh, we took a bunch of defensive tackles. Yeah. I kind of like that strategy. Take a bunch and see who, see uh, who sticks. See who sticks. And it is the NFL. And the, the, the defensive line, they had, they, had the, they had the worst pressure rate of um, any any defense in the league. The defense was just as big. It was, it, was, it was a bigger problem than the offense. They needed bodies there, like des- desperately. Yeah. And if you so they got uh, Gervon Dexter from Florida, as you said, and then Zach Pickens from South Carolina. I can't pretend to know anything more about Ken- Kennesaw State guy, or or even those two. It's like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like I sure. watch a lot of college football, but I can't say that like either one of those. Quick, two guys- where's Kennesaw State? 
Uh, Ohio? I have no fucking clue. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, great trivia question. <laughs> no, well, that just it up. It's, um, I like, like those kind of fine ju- guys, though. Just, you know? just having like, uh, like, just bodies to rotate in. So even if like you know they're not a, a three down player. Even if you're just flipping those two guys back and forth, the you know throughout the game, keep everybody fresh. Yeah, you know they needed they needed an upgrade in talent. It feels like at least they addressed a position of need, and it's again it's 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 like trust polls mode. Like if he thinks he's worth drafting there, and and they flash, you know they like that guy De- De- Gervin, Gervon Dexter. He's a fucking low Georgia. Okay, Georgia, Kansas yeah. State, Georgia. But look at this. It's the home of Justin Fields. Ooh, yeah. probably should have known that. Actually, then. I and Dansby Swanson. I knew that. I did I knew know Kennesaw, that. I knew they were from Kennesaw, Georgia. For some reason, my dumb brain didn't. It, that's didn't how mine com- was didn't too. Didn't compute that Kennesaw State was in Kennesaw. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I, I like it. I and it's like I, I was really high on Witherspoon. And I thought the team really needed a corner. I don't know much about this Tyreek Stevenson other than the same things that everybody else has read and watched. But it's like, hey, they traded up to go get a guy. And that there was uh, a theme for the Bears is that they have that new scoring system, a relative athletic score. Have you guys yeah, seen the RAS? Yeah, everybody loves throwing Raz, those yeah, yeah, yeah. rounds. Yeah. And, like, everybody is, like, in the top 500 versus, like, out of the 17,000 people that have played since, like, 1992. Yeah, they're, they're all, like, over yeah. an eight or something like that. So whatever for whatever that's worth, they're getting, they're getting very athletic dudes they got dudes they got a bunch of dudes like and that's the thing with darnell right it's like an old high school football expression but like i think the bears are going to look pretty fucking good coming off the bus like that that gervon dexter is like six six three hundred something darnell Wright six six three thirty freak freak athlete they got big they got big dudes on out of a this lot, draft a lot of people had paused on gervon dexter i saw some some bad grades for him and a lot mm-hmm. of people thought the bears reached but he's a guy, you say, when it's like a Getsy scheme, he's a guy where it's like he's an Eberflus guy oh, in my yeah. mind. People saw the flashes, and from what I read, that his his job, and I think Paul said it as well, like he was supposed to be a mirror guy, mm-hmm. kind of see what's going on. He was a little slow off the ball. And uh, when that changes and he gets into the right scheme, that's probably what they're seeing, and that makes me hopeful. Yeah, they kept, they were, were both of those guys, they kept using the phrase, they're going to dent the pocket. They're going to dent the pocket. So mm-hmm. just like pushing guys back. And that, and you're right, that's what Everflus wants. He wants D tackles that can attack and, and collapse the pocket from the inside. Yeah. And they, and you know, they're, they're big fucking 300 pound dudes. They're not going to be easy to push around the run game either. So, yeah. And uh, then Roshan Johnson, you mentioned him earlier. There's, when we picked him, it's great when you have a guy, when you tweet about him and people, legitimately run they scream from the rooftops to tell you how much they love them because that's what texas fans did. i was getting dms from texas fans yeah yeah like you're gonna fucking love this guy like he's just the best dude he also works his balls off uh Mm -hmm. obviously went to texas he was behind Bijan, but hey Mm -hmm. you know who backed up ricky williams priest holmes yeah you know what i mean i'm not saying he's priest holmes but alabama had had ingram and richardson not that richardson turned out to be uh a good pro, but he won the. I think he won the Heisman Trophy, did he not? And he was he a did, backup. Yeah. So like 20, sometimes you just get 11, fucking kids that are just like they're just program guys. I feel like Georgia, Miami had you know Frank Gore like didn't play that much because he was behind Clinton Portis and people like that. So it definitely happens. Like you can be a, a stud guy, but to your to your point about Roshan, did, did you ever see the quote from Sark? About Roshan? Yeah. No. So oh, it's great. He goes, yeah. I owe a lot to him. I owe a lot to our leadership committee. And, and Oh, that wasn't Sark, though, was it? No, I thought that, was, that was the Tulsa head coach. No, that was Sark. No, oh, was Steve there? Okay, Sarkeesian, okay. Yeah. yeah. it was Sark. Uh, but Ro, there have been a couple very significant moments that, you know, somebody needed to stand up. My voice can only go so far when it, until it comes from a peer. He took the initiative and did that. Very eloquent in his messaging to the team, but in a way that I felt the players heard it and continue to hear it when he speaks. I think – when you talk about it, what it is to be a Texas long, whole, Longhorn football player, in my mind, I think of Roshan Johnson because he's a selfless player. And he goes, it, it goes on for like another full pair. Yeah, it's like mm-hmm. super long. And it's just like that is just a coach who's like, this is this is like he wants to like it. He you would can't like have, have too marry many. off his well, daughter. To actually, like you know what? You can have too many of those guys because. Like if you have too well, many, you don't have one. It's like the Deion Sanders. You're talking like the Deion Sanders quote. Not necessarily. I was okay. just. I mean, eventually you got to just get freak athletes. I don't care. Like, who yeah, they but are, this guy's but, also yeah, a freak athlete. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's going to be a perfect complement, kind yeah. of lightning thunder with. Uh, he's Glover. a core special it's, team guy. And you asked Brandon Thorne later on, yeah, um, about Roshan and kind of how he fits in with Khalil Herbert because Khalil Herbert stinks in pass pro. 
Roshan doesn't. And that's big with when you need to pass, you know, obviously. The quote I saw was from Stan Drayton. He's the Temple head coach, and he was the okay. running backs coach before, and he had something like the same. Okay. Whereas the guy thanked him for being like, I'm the man I am because I coached him. Like the impact he's <laughs> yeah. having on coaches. That's, that's high yeah. next level. Yeah, yeah. so it, it really is. It you really don't have to give to lip see. service on that kind of stuff. I, I no. like I like that group of running backs. I, I do too. I think Khalil yeah. Herbert's fast. I Dante Foreman, you know, he he was a backup as well for Christian McCaffrey. So like his numbers are underwhelming. But as soon as they got rid of Christian McCaffrey, he was getting like a hundred yards a game. Mm-hmm. I and mean, he looks like a pretty big, nasty physical back. And then Roshan in the mix somewhere yeah. at some point. Like they have they got good football players now. And then skill groups. I mean, everyone loved Tyler Scott, the wide receiver from yeah. Cincinnati. Little mm-hmm. guy, but he could fly. He seems he to just go. He he looks to me like a guy who, if uh, if they don't want to pay Mooney, then he slides. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's what it's like insurance think, for him. Hopefully yeah. he's better than Phelis Jones Jr. That whole running back group is going to be. It's, yeah, it's almost like you don't care who's in the game kind of thing, which is yeah. a, good, a good thing. Claypool, Mooney, him, and um, – Obviously, more. It's gonna mm-hmm. be. It's gonna. It's gonna be pretty interesting Comet. to see. So yep. we'll see. And then last note was, like I said, you mentioned Tyreek Stevenson. You hope that he could slot in with yeah. Jalen Johnson and um, and he's and, supposed uh, to be a perimeter Gordon. guy where Gordon is more of a, a slot guy, mm-hmm. nickel guy. So that makes sense too. Yeah, a All lot right. to like. Yeah, a lot to like. But that's you know that's kind of the name of the draft, right? Where you. Well, it's, you always love everything until you don't. Right, but it is it's nicer to be like all the analysts, which I mean again, like you said, you have to see it on the field eventually, but it's better to be in the discussion of the teams that had the best draft and the teams that improved the most than teams where that have a lot of, you know, like what were they doing? Yeah. So, and the Bears are definitely in in the the discussion yeah. of being one of the better teams in the draft. Cuz I I tweeted that out too initially after the pick and it, it was an emotional tweet about how, you know, We'll always remember Jalen Carter, and we'll always yeah. be watching Skaronski. I don't feel that way about Jalen as much anymore because he really did need to go to a situation where he could learn yeah. from guys like Fletcher Cox. And uh, I, I think that Bears don't have that kind of guy to bring mm-hmm. him under his wing right now. Um, Skaronski, sure, that point that point remains, but we'll see. It is what it is at this point. You know, you trust Ryan Poles, and I'm excited about Darnold, right? Another interesting one to put in the tickler file too is uh, Joey Porter Jr., who went number thirty-two. Yeah, uh, that's the Claypool. That's one. Pick. Yes, it's yeah. the Claypool pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, you know, we'll see. He's where he's supposed to be. He goes yeah, to Pittsburgh. He is. Yeah, that's but, like fate uh, in a way. It's going to be another one that's going to be tough to swallow, though. If things, yeah, if he turns you know, into like a yes. superstar, yeah, for sure, yeah, for will, sure. But, but uh, I, I am like, I feel like people were too quick to just throw dirt on Claypool too. I think he'll have his moments yeah. and be an effective player for this team. Yeah, I don't disagree. It's just if you in hindsight it's 2020 if you know you're going to do the DJ Moore deal, but if you know that you have the Moore deal now, like it probably changes a lot of trajectory of the team, so I don't yeah. know. It's a butterfly effect with yeah. this. It really is. But you didn't know. Yeah. yeah. You didn't know. Um You didn't know until you maybe got the number 1 pick. So. All right, let's kick it over to Brandon Thorn. Whoosh. All right, so now we are in uh, another interview portion of the show. We are joined by offensive line analyst uh, from the Trench Warfare Newsletter and Bleacher Report, Brandon Thorne. Uh, Brandon, welcome back. I know we've had you before. And, uh, I mean, we'll just start this off out of the gate. Uh, Darnell Wright or Peter Skaronsky, who were you taking there with the Bears pick at number 10? Yeah. Um, I mean, just staying true to my, my grades and stuff of, of all these guys, I, I probably would have taken Skaronsky, you know, just cause I think he was a little bit more, uh, ready to go polished. Um, you know, it just more of a technician, you know, than Darnell Wright, which, uh, you know, I, I can understand the case for right there. You know, I think maybe the upside there is a little bit more, you know, he's bigger, he's more powerful, uh, you know, things like that. But Skronsky to me was just uh, just a very clean kind of prospect. There wasn't a lot of projection there or anything like that. So I, I felt a little bit better about Skronsky. Um, they were in kind of the same neighborhood, I think, you know, in, in terms of grade. But for me, you know, I liked I like Skronsky a little bit more. Do you think Skronsky will eventually kick inside like everyone had been speculating? Or do you think he's a long term tackle? Yeah, you know, I I kind of thought of him more as a guard when I did my uh, evaluation and everything and projection um, who could play tackle. 
you know, that's kind of how I saw him. Very similar, you know, to Joe Tooney. Uh, that was my comparison for him, who was a left tackle at NC State, who obviously plays guard. Brandon Scherf, Ali Marpet, Joel Batonio, you know, Elijah Vera Tucker. There's so many guys that are high quality left tackles in college that just kick inside and are really good. And that's just kind of how I saw him. But he could play tackle. And, you know, for, for the Titans especially, their offensive line is so bad. Uh, he's the best offensive lineman on the team right now, I think. So he could play pretty much wherever, I think, there. You know, so it'll be interesting to see. How does the Bears line for 2023 now with Wright and hopefully an assumed jump uh, from – from Braxton Jones and then also the the free agent acquisition from the Titans. How does how do they grade as a unit in your eyes going forward versus what they had last year? Will Justin Fields get killed this year? Yeah, that's what he's asking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I that's interesting cuz you know, when you're watching offensive line and pass protection, I think you kind of have to tie it together with the quarterback. And when you look at Fields last year, I think, you know, some of that was on him. Uh, but, you know, maybe being slow to process, you know, standing back there a little too long, you know, things like that, not pulling the trigger in time. But then also, yeah, clearly the offensive line wasn't good either. So, but I think it kind of went hand in hand. But, yeah, I, I do think in terms of, you know, this year, just with the additions that you said, they're definitely going to be better, um, you know, and then assuming guys are, you know, healthy again. So, like a, Lu a Lucas Patrick, you know, who – I think at this point is probably going to be their top interior swing backup who could play guard or center if any of those guys go down, um, goes down. So I think like he he's a really key piece for depth. Uh, I think left guard is going to be very interesting right now. I think I guess that's the only position up for grabs. But uh, you know Tevin Jenkins or I mean maybe Alex Leatherwood. Uh, I'm sure those two guys are going to compete. And then maybe one of those late round guys they picked last year maybe one of those guys is going to compete for that job. You know, Jeter Carter, I, I scouted him. Um, I know they have Kellen Deesh. They have they have a bunch of guys who are going to compete for depth probably. But I think left guard's interesting. But, yeah, big upgrade at, at right guard with Nate Davis. Right tackle is going to be upgraded with Darnell Wright. Uh, if Whitehair is healthy and ready to go, which assuming he is at center, I, I mean, I like Whitehair at center most, in my opinion. He's the, the best football that he's ever played has been at center. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first three, four years of his career, I believe he only played center. So um, that's kind of a natural fit for him. Um, I think this offensive line could be solid, you know, not great, but not bad like they were last year. So I I'm, I see like middle of the pack and the potential for more because they're pretty young as well, at least at tackle. Yeah, I'm, they are. And like, like you said, we just threw that deal at Davis. But I feel like I, we, we should go back to Darnell Wright, Darnell Wright a little bit more here. What What's something that you could tell Bears fans that in your evaluation of him that would make us excited about him? Yeah, it's, it's really easy to get excited about Darnell Wright. Um, I mean, I think you have to start with his combination of size, you know, 6'5", 330, um, with his power and then his demeanor. Those three things, you know, which is kind of similar to like Tevin Jenkins coming out, though. I think the difference is, you know, Darnell Wright moves better than than Tevin, um, a little bit lighter on his feet, uh, and he has better balance. You know, that's the thing that really sold me on Darnell Wright. Like, even though I would take Skaronsky, you know, before him, I, I was a big Darnell Wright, Darnell Wright guy early on in the process. I think January is when I put my, my, my grade on him after I watched all the film and everything before the Senior Bowl. And the thing that really sold me, like I said, like, you know, big, strong, physical, uh, that stuff is clear. I thought he was the most powerful blocker in the class. But, man, his ability to to maintain his balance when guys are trying to run through him, um, he can recover, you know, really well for a guy that big. Typically, big guys don't, like, 330 plus, they're not recovering very well. They, it, it, you know, things can fall apart for them pretty quickly. Um, but man, that's, that's what I really liked about him. And I think, you know, reading the pieces that have come out of, you know, Ryan Poles and, and, and everybody talking about what they liked about him. I think that's kind of the same thing, just like his ability to recover is kind of the deal that, you know, that, that really is going to make him have the potential to be like a pro bowl kind of guy. You know, I think that's definitely, you know, in the cards for him, but, uh, Day one, he's just going to be a guy who is going to kind of set the tone, I think, for the offensive line. And and it's it's cool because, I mean, Brian or Braxton Jones even, like, 
the the best thing that he did coming out and the best thing that he did last year in my opinion is just his physicality and what he brings in the run game um this is going to be a big physical you know offensive line um center you know white hair is not that guy he's more of like a technician quick guy he's he's not that but at tackle it's going to be really cool to watch those guys especially in the run game cuz yeah the, it's it's going to be physical and those guys are really good at run blocking so that should be fun but what I, what I something I, I really knew that the bears liked was that he was a natural right tackle so he was just plugging right in there from what he played before that's that's kind of really giving the vote of confidence to Braxton Jones. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a late mm-hmm. round pick. Uh, he was very Small durable. School. Played every sign, every snap last year. But yeah. are, are are you tell is he are, are we that positive? He's the left tackle of the future. Like, do you, do you like him that much? Uh, I'm not totally sold on it, honestly. I mean, you know, I'm looking at my scouting like report right now when when he was coming out because I was able to get all the all the tape there at Southern Utah. I watched a lot of him. Then saw him at the Senior Bowl. Um, I mean, you know, fifth round pick, that was my grade as well. You know, fifth round grade, you know, he was a developmental guy. He outperformed my expectations last year, you know, uh, in terms of starting every game and not missing a snap and all that. But at the same time, I think he has some issues in pass protection specifically that I'm not sure how correctable they are. Um, I don't think it's like a, a strength thing as much as it's a technique thing. And also, there's there's kind of a technical term in pass protection called range, you know, and it's kind of like foot quickness. It's, you know, your ability to to protect the corner against guys who are really good at speed rushing, you know, like the speed, like the Von Millers, you know, um, and just guys like that, Brian Burns, you know, guy, guys who are super fast off the edge. Those guys, I think, are always just going to give him a little bit of trouble um, or, or maybe a lot of trouble, hopefully not too much. You know, I think you kind of have to scheme around that uh you know and just kind of help him a little bit against certain matchups and i don't know that that's going to change but it's clear that he does you know bring uh a lot of value in the run game um so if you can build you know kind of the right system around him you know not make him the best offensive lineman on the you know the unit or even the second best um if he's like the third or fourth best guy then I think you can make it work, you know, and he could be a potential long-term starter. But, yeah, I don't ever see him being like a high-end starter. You know, I just yeah. think more so he could be solid eventually, but that that's kind of what I see with him. Yeah, it's really something I don't think enough people are paying attention to. In my opinion, because that was one thing. It was like, oh, it's a foregone conclusion. It's like, well, are we that? Are we there yet? And I, I don't know. It's also, I mean, he's probably going to be on the same side as Tevin Jenkins, I believe. It, where, where are you at on mm-hmm. him? This is almost a, he's, he's been make or break for him. Oft yeah. injured, year yeah. three, uh, second rounder, high pick. Where, where are you at on him? Yeah, I mean, I thought last year certainly was like the, the, the best stuff he showed so far, mm-hmm. which maybe not saying a whole lot considering, you know, the back injury when he came in as a rookie and just missed a lot of time and, um, but last year you start you started to see some of what you were hoping for coming out of Oklahoma State, and, you know, and just using his size, his power. Um, it's clear that he has a lot of power and size that he can apply in the run game and move people. He he's a tone setter as well. He's physical, almost a little too physical at times. You know, not knowing when to kind of back off a little bit, but you kind of like that at the same time. So he brings that edge, you know, that you want. And he has the size to back it up. But I just think uh, footwork, you know, like the, the nuances, hand placement, um, you, you know, not being able to recover super well, uh, just just being a little wild. You know, there's 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 kind of that element to his game that we'll see if that can get kind of ironed out and fixed over time. But, yeah, it's it's not a sure thing that he's going to be a long term starter either, I don't think. But at least he's young enough to where, you know, and he's shown some 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 glimmers of hope last year to where he has a shot you know the, the, there's still it's it's an open door i think still for him to turn into a starter so we'll see but yeah i think what you mentioned him playing next to braxton jones that's a little worrisome you know on the left side with those two guys together i mean uh yeah especially in pass protection you know run game should be fun you know that, that'll be mm-hmm. awesome but pass protection and I'm, i i mean like true drop back passing when the defense knows you're passing that's what I'm talking about. Like first, second down, when you can run play action and RPOs, that's different because you could kind of run block in, in a way on those reps. But, you know, third and seven or whatever, you know, obvious pass situations, 
that's when the offensive line, you know, is really stressed. And those are the situations that I kind of worry about. But if you could stay out of those situations, obviously every offensive coordinator wants to do that. The yeah. more you could stay out of those situations and have a good run game and work play action, the better. But yeah, true drop back <laughs> situations, that's that's going to get a little hairy, I think, with those two guys. All right. Well, you're scaring me more than I hoped you would. Yeah. I, I, I got to say. I don't know if I so, like this anymore. Yeah. I, I, I kind of just want to hang up, to be honest. <laughs> but, but is there is there any... Is there development on some of these technique things that you see typically in young linemen where it's like, hey, like, yeah, Braxton Jones played every snap, come, big uh, jump, obviously, from Southern Utah. Mm-hmm. Can he just from a technique point and maybe an, an athleticism point from having a full year uh, in an NFL strength program, can we see a, a jump from him? Does that happen? Or in your experience, are guys kind of what they are by the time they're, they're 24, 25? No, I mean, you, you could definitely see a jump, especially with a guy like that coming out of Southern Utah, you know, a small school with, I think the term, you know, when we say NFL weight room, that gets thrown around a little loosely. Like if a guy's coming from Georgia, like it's, who cares, you know, yeah, that he's I going to an NFL yeah. weight room or not even just Georgia, but the majority of division one schools, it's just like, there's not that much of a difference or less of a difference than I think many people would, would, you know, suspect. Hmm. But yeah, Southern Utah, that's that's a different deal. Like if you're coming from a school like that, there is a lot of credence to it. So I think he could, you know, he could he could get stronger, but he's already strong. You know, when I watch him, <laughs> excuse me, I, I mean, I see a strong player. His play strength wasn't ever the issue to me. It's more of a technique thing. And that's one of those things that isn't guaranteed uh, of getting there um ideally in a situation where the offensive line coach is a proven you know developer of talent bill callahan mike munchek uh you know jeff stoutland uh andy heck there, there's some guys out there who just consistently get the most out of their guys um the offensive line coach here you know from atlanta uh chris morgan mm-hmm. I, um I, I can't really recall many like great success stories from atlanta their offensive line wasn't very good for a while um so, you know, that is what it is. We'll, we'll see, though. Um, you know, they had some decent players like Jake Matthews, and um, they had Alex Mack there for a while, but he was already good. So, you know, that's the thing. You know, I just – for me, it's more of an unknown than, than anything with Braxton specifically. I'm not saying it's impossible, but, you know, I, it's hard to feel good about it, And you know, in my opinion at this point. All right, so just run the damn ball. We'll get those hats back on sale. <laughs> Are you, uh, Brandon? I know you're primarily offensive line. Do you or do you follow yeah. the you know running backs, pa- pass blocking, and whatnot at all? A little bit. I mean, I'll see guys make blocks, you know, yeah. and I'll note it. And you know, you see guys reoccurring making great blocks, you know, that are really good at it. But I don't sit there and you know study the running backs, you know, snap, you know, start to finish and stuff like that. But I, I do know some some names, you know, if you want to. Yeah, well, that's what, you know, the Bears kind of put themselves in a situation here where Khalil Herbert, maybe not the best uh, pass blo- pass blocking uh, back, yeah. but then, you know, we drafted Roshan Johnson, who by all accounts is good at this, uh, Travis Homer from Seattle, we signed him. Uh, so maybe we're putting ourselves in a situation where they're prepared for this. I don't know what, what, what where, where you stand on that. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I from what I've heard about Rashawn Johnson, he's just like kind of a really good all around, you know, kind of back who who will be able to, assuming he you know just gets, gets a playbook and stuff like that, and just the mental side, like he's a willing blocker, he's physical, um, decent size as well for, as far as I know. So yeah, he he might be that guy on those true drop back situations that I mentioned where he's in there. Um, I know Dante Foreman is extremely physical. I don't know anything about his pass pro, but um, you know, he's a, like a big physical guy as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely, you know, are going to need the backs and I'm sure tight ends as well. Uh, you know, even like Robert Tunyon, I, he's probably a guy who could provide some help and pass protection as well. Um, I, I would imagine the scheme, I know it's an outside zone, you know, zone oriented type of scheme, which typically, you know, it involves a lot of play action. Uh, which is going to be great. You know, the more play action you can run and the more you can have success passing out of play action and RPOs as well, that's just going to make everybody's life easier, you know, offensive line and quarterback. So I think that's the plan. And, uh, 
you know, it, I think it's a pretty good plan right now for with what they're working with. I, I like the direction that they're headed. I don't want to like, you know, crap on these guys, you know, like and <laughs> I'm going to try to be, you know, unbiased about it yeah. or, or whatnot, but I like the plan. I like the scheme and I, I feel like they're definitely going to be better. Yeah. We, we didn't really touch on Nate Davis that much either. When, you know, yeah. He's a newcomer. Uh, what can you really tell us about him? Because like you said, we just haven't seen the guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's coming from a system that was a heavy run scheme in Tennessee, a lot of play action, so he's going to fit right in. Um, they ran a lot of zone as well. So he's a physical, like, he's just a physical, good run blocker. Um, decent in pass protection, you know, solid average. You know, he'll get, he'll, he's functional. You know, you could get by with him. Um, he's not going to be a guy who's going to, like, do extremely well against like elite level three techniques out there, you know, but in the, in this sort of system, um, he fits really well. I totally get why you would want Nate Davis here. Uh, he's played really good football next to Jack Conklin when he was there in Tennessee, uh, for several years. And Conklin is, you know, in a similar type of mold as Darnell Wright, you know, being a better run blocker than pass blocker, but big physical, you know, really good run blockers. I, I think him and Nate Davis, Wright and Nate Davis are going to be, a really good duo um you know their strengths complement each other and uh yeah but he that's kind of what he brings he's a kind of a shorter guy you know stout good natural leverage and a really like skilled run blocker as well so yeah that's you know kind of what you expect with him okay and then i i know i know you're primarily um uh, we, we talked before that with, when it comes to the defensive tackles uh you mm -hmm. saw a little bit of tape on gervin dexter right Anything yeah. on uh, Pickens, or what are we looking at as far as the defensive guys look like? Yeah, I haven't really seen much Pickens, but, I mean, Dexter, I watched several guys on the offensive line this year face Florida, so um, you, you kind of just watch the guys they're facing, and Dexter was a guy who, you know, I, I think he got picked in probably the right spot. You know, he's a day two kind of pick because it's mostly flashes with him, but granted, the flashes are, like, really special. Um even I remember last year, you know, uh, 2021, he had some crazy flashes uh, watching other guys as well. So it's been a couple of years now where, you know, it's probably three, four plays a game where, you know, his ability to disengage off of block, you know, using crazy quickness at his size, good hands, you know, like that stuff flashes and it, you know, it makes you sit up in your seat and notice because not a lot of guys are even capable of doing that. So, um, it's just he'll also kind of disappear, you know, for stretches of the game as well. So that's kind of what you're you're getting. He's still, you know, obviously a young guy and, you know, could maybe bridge that gap, you know, become a little bit more consistent. Even if he just becomes a little bit more consistent, I, st I think you probably have a solid player. If he becomes like really consistent and dials in and, you know, can make more of those flashes happen. I mean, you, you could have a really good starter there. So that's the kind of guy you want to pick on day two, though. You know, the, the, kind of what I just described. You want a guy to have the, that upside that's shown it over, you know, multiple seasons, but hasn't quite got there yet. That's kind of what you're getting, and you're hoping for, you know, that his best football is ahead of him. Now, um, how much in your film breakdown or your breakdown of a – and analysis of a player as a whole, do you take mental makeup uh, into yeah. account? Yeah, I mean, it's hit or miss. You know, it's it, it depends on what kind of connections I have to the player. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a ton of them, but there are some players, some coaches that I talk to, you know, uh, people in the building, you know, and you, you kind of, it's hard not to factor that in. Um, you know, when you hear stuff, especially when you hear it from multiple people, you know, in the building and then, you know, th then you kind of, you know, have it confirmed. Uh, so yeah, that plays into it a little bit, but it's hit, like I said, hit or miss. Cause I'd say the majority of the time that doesn't, it's mostly just like 95% film. Um, and then I'll look at, you know, testing stuff and, yeah. uh, you know, just kind of see how much of an outlier they are in that regard, you know, with the testing, um, I look at age as well. I think age is an important thing to look at uh, just because it kind of dictates the runway that they have to improve. If a rookie comes in, he's 24, as opposed to a guy who's 21. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you'd rather have the 21 year old if all things were even. Um, so age, you know, kind of plays a part in into it a little bit as well. 
So like, those are the things that I look into, but mental makeup is tricky because unless you have multiple sources confirming it, you know, it's hard to put a lot of, cre you know, credence into that. So yeah, it's, now, it just depends. The reason I asked that is because I was watching, um, Jervon Dexter's, it was his post draft, like kind of interview. And I know that's a lot of fluff, like, Oh, you're going to get the best defensive tackle, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, he said a few things that stuck out to me. He's like, look, like I'm the best defensive tackle in the draft and here's why. And I don't know if you saw this. It was like 30, 40 seconds. It was quick. But um, mm -hmm. he's like, I, I went through multiple co uh, coaches in college, multiple coaches in high school. They were all telling me do this. And then the next guy would be like, no, that was wrong. Do this, do that. And he's like, once that kind of just like was me, that's when I dominated football games. And that's when I took over in the SEC. And um. Like, is there a way to kind of weight that? And I know that doesn't really go into mental makeup. Like, do you get in trouble? Do you not get in trouble? But I feel like there is credence behind just that little quick quote. Like, ah, maybe he is just raw. And this is the guy that is, you know, the perfect second round pick. Because if you can tap into that just raw potential and get him with, you know, any sort of consistent coaching staff that can really bring it out of him, like, I think this guy could be good, you know? Yeah, that's a part of it with, a lot of prospects, man. I mean, you have to look at, you know, and I, I, I do look at that as well. You look at coaching staffs and you look at how long they've been there. I mean, whenever you're researching a player and I look at it, I, I do like to look at coaching staffs if I don't already, you know, if I'm not already familiar with it and uh, just see, because especially with the offensive line, there's some guys that come into the pros and they've had three offensive line coaches in four years, you know, and then obviously you it's hard to like put a, a number on that or like exactly how much you should weigh that, but it's something to consider. I'll put it in the notes section of the scouting mm -hmm. report, for instance, just so, you know, it, it's there. It's, it's, um, I think it's relevant, you know, for sure. Uh, I don't know the specifics with him. I know that Florida just got a new coaching staff this past year. So that's at least a second, um, you know, and maybe he's had several, you know, other, you know, position coaches there. So, that's something to certainly consider. I mean, it, you know, some guys are able to deal with that better than others. Some guys still can just kind of, uh, you know, adapt and adjust and still be good. Some guys, it really messes with them. And you just don't know, you know, until they come in and hopefully Chicago can provide that stability for them. I mean, that's the thing that's tough too. Guys don't have a lot of stability a lot of the time in the NFL. That's why situation matters, where they go. Uh, you know, I think when you're scouting for a specific team, it changes everything. Because mm -hmm. for me, I'm just trying to project to the NFL, you know, generally. Um, if I was scouting for a specific team, then it's like, okay, I know my coach. I know what he likes. I know his track record. I know he's going to play next to. I know what it, you know, all these things. So, um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I think there's something there. It's hard to say exactly what it is for Dexter, but yeah, hopefully, you know, that stability is a, is a key for him. Mm -hmm. Well, Brandon, thanks so much for jumping on with us. Uh, we appreciate it. Where could people find your stuff? Yeah, they could go to trenchwarfare.substack.com. Um, that's where I write uh, all my stuff pretty much um, for offensive and defensive line, do film rooms and all kinds of different breakdowns there. Uh, and then Bleacher Report is where I did all my scouting reports this year for uh, the offensive line class. So you can pretty much just type in an offensive lineman's name and Bleacher Report and, you know, my report will come up. So people can get that as well there. And uh, you are a better film breaker downer -er than Stephen <laughs> Shea, correct? <laughs> Uh, I mean, yep. Yeah. Just, just say, say yes. yes. Just, just say, say yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say yes. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you to Brandon. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff there. That guy knows the O line in and out. He watches more tape better than, than anybody. Than yes. <laughs> yeah. Way better than Shay. That's a good way to put it. Um, all right. Let's get into some baseball here. White Sox, Dave. It seems to be a trend where if you think it can't get worse, it always does. Um, besides Sunday's game, a seven spot in the ninth inning to win and break a, a 10 game losing streak. That almost felt fake to me. It felt like a like yeah. rookie of the year, major league, like a team who's down on their luck. And it was like a simulation, like some fucking angels in the outfield. And 
it, it was almost it's like the guys who play the Harlem Globetrotters. So yeah, they, they yeah, end up losing at yes. the end every time. There was something that felt so. Weird. Did, did you feel that at all or not? Yeah, and I, I had gone to the game the day before, and that kind of felt fake. I'm like, oh my god, they had no hitter going into the seventh inning, and then whoosh, ten spot. There was okay. I'll say this: there wasn't a doubt in my mind that they lost the game that Lynn brought the no. What was it the seventh? Seventh, yeah. Uh, Lynn brought the no hitter into the seventh, and. That enti- like the entire game. Then they gave up the go ahead home run. I think it was to a Rose Arena mm-hmm. um, on Sunday. I had a weird feeling. Then they get down by six. I was like, oh, obviously it's over. But I had that weird feeling. Then they got a couple runners on. Like I think they're gonna walk this one off. They did. But here's where I'm at. I don't care if they rattle off twenty in a row. I really don't. <laughs> I don't believe it's, you. Because it's it's. It, it, but the team's not good enough. I, yeah. They have a stretch coming up where it's just dog shit team after they got Cincinnati coming up, mm-hmm. Kansas City. Their April schedule was brutal, but they also played horrifically. So it doesn't matter if they were playing the Royals or Reds; they were going to be losing a lot of baseball games, anyways. You have like everybody has seen all the meltdown that White Sox fans and the media have uh, kind of been having over the last two weeks and it's all it's all come to come to come to a head where like every bad part of the organization it's it's very 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 apparent to anybody with eyeballs right now you got the minor league developments they don't have anybody like coming up Mm -hmm. in waves like they talked about there we talked to dr layman like these guys are constantly hurt They've regressed. Um, it, it's it's bad. And then it's you have the fire. owner. It's a dumpster fire from top yeah. to bottom. Yeah, it is. And then you have the owner going on yeah. with Rachel Nichols. Finishing a month with single-digit wins is... They didn't win a series or two games. In, they haven't won a series yet. They finally won two games in a row. So. First time they won two go. games in a row. We're recording this, this on uh, Wednesday, by the way. Yeah. So right now, they uh, if they win today, they have a win streak. Yeah. It's exciting. That's yeah. it's not though. Yeah. It's not because all it is is it's lipstick on a pig. This organization is it needs to be burnt to the ground and start from complete scratch. I'm not talking about like the 2016 rebuild where you trade everybody. And like the dude who called into ESPN Waddle and Sylvie, like he said, he's like, they they're consistently a a bottom rung farm system. Mm-hmm. Older than the years where they traded guys that like anybody in this room, including Hannah could have traded those players and gotten huge returns back for them. And as soon as they graduate from prospect status, they're back to being shitty again. Mm-hmm. And you heard Jerry, Jerry Reinsdorf himself. He, he told on himself many times in this symposium thing he did with Rachel Nichols over the weekend or whatever it was. And it, he's like, I don't want to, I don't want to set the market for a 40 to it, it's so they're never going to get these big name free agents. Cause the owner won't do it by his own words. Um, like I, I really want to just go quote by quote and break down what he said. I know you guys want nothing to do with that, but like I almost don't care and just want to just rattle off all the contradictions he made in that, in that uh, like that symposium he was at. Well, Dave, it's to the point where I don't think you even need to. Yeah, I think everyone sees it now. It, it, it's time, and and I think it's finally there's finally being headway made where people are really fed up. Oh like that's, yeah, that's They're- that's. The most I've really seen, like I kind of feel like a movement going. You know, they it, were throwing full beers over the nets at the game on Saturday when they when they blew the no hitter and just got smoked. Like people, there was like everybody was throwing trash on the field. So, and they had to sell the team chance going throughout mm-hmm. the entire stadium. You know, whoever was left there, and then they they gave away like these White Sox like hockey jerseys, and people were like throwing those away too on their way out. Like people, people were, are fucking furious. Yeah. I I mean I could be wrong here, but I've never seen a fan base so mad with ownership in Chicago. Like I don't remember it being this bad yeah. in the Garpax years. Uh, Blackhawks, that's more niche. People got really mad at McCaskey. Yeah, and, and things were really grim there. Remember that year when. They brought. I mean, we we had sell the team bear shirts too. Yeah, you, yeah, you made those. I yeah. got in trouble for those. By who? <laughs> Can't yeah. say. Okay. Look at this fucking guy telling Sox fans not even to bother coming in. Like he's right. I've been to one Sox game this year. It's May third. At this point, any other given year, I would have been at at least seven eight. Yeah. 
No, oh, he's right. Sell he, Jerry, sell. Like that's like. That's a good guy in the front lines, man. That guy's everything White Sox. Every single thing, like, this guy doesn't have social media or nothing. Yeah. Like, he's just fed those up are, those and are iron sick on letters and that he made fucking himself. tired of Facebook losing product. baseball games. And it's not even the losing. It's that they fuck up everything. They fuck up everything. I mean, yeah. say what you want about the Clevenger signing, like, black eye in the organization, even if they had nothing to do with it. It's like, like... They let guy. they let guys walk in the middle of their competitive window, and it's always money. It always goes back to money with Jerry Ryan's door. If he needs to sell the team, <laughs> well, that's that's what it, like for you, there you to be life. any fucking hope on earth, and that's that's just it. And this isn't it. Like even if they do rattle off like a twenty-two and eight month, and you know do claw back into this thing, it's it's just masking all of the issues that are around this thing, and it's bad. Everybody needs to get fired from fucking uh, Kenny Williams through the entire uh, development staff, training staff, everybody. Everybody has to go. You have to trade everybody that has any value at all. And you need, like the dude from Birdo from the West Side said, you need to take some of your money. I mean, he bought the team for $19 million in 1981. It's worth billions now. Take some of that money and go get a front office who you won't meddle with, who will fix it. But he's not going to do that because he he wants his fucking guys in there that that yep. that just kind of bow down to him. Mm -hmm. and but he did, like, say the opposite in that symposium. Oh, uh, he – okay, which which you can Where bring up the like, quotes. Well, I, the, I, I'm not going to bring it up. I don't have it in front of me, but he did say, like, you know, you have to hire your baseball people and let them be baseball people. Exactly. So yeah. the – almost exact quote was if if you think you're smarter than your own GM you have the wrong GM he forced Tony La Russa down the White Sox throat mm -hmm. he did that he he meddled in the Manny Machado Bryce Harper negotiations like he is at the forefront of all these like he he takes control like you go own collect your billions and let the baseball guys do their thing it's not 1980 anymore it's 2023 uh, many many status quos have changed and it's it's a shame what he has done to this organization um david what point it, are you going to take it into your own hands here what can you do to do your part what can you do to really be on the front line is, is a statue chaining out of the question here i'm being honest like yeah I feel you're, like you're joking around no you're not being honest no 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 like i feel like you Ed, should do something there is absolutely right or no nothing any fan can do other than stop going to games. And I've been to one game. I, I considered going Saturday just because it, it, like, the social aspect of it, how seeing much people is, I haven't seen in a how month. How much is parking in Lot B? I don't know. I never park. 20 bucks, I think. 25 I, bucks. I think that you should just, next time they have, like, a Sunday day game or, or a Saturday game, you should just hold a rally in, in Lot B and just not go That's in. That's not me, though. I'm not, like, I'm not going to tell people what to do or how to be a fan or whatnot. Like, I, I'm – that's all, like, no, but shock like you, value you, to you, me. That's not me at all. I am – like, if you don't want – I'm not renewing my season tickets next year. If you don't want to, I'm not going to tell you not to. Right. I wouldn't if I were you. Like, the fucking guys that don't even bother – like, why would you willingly – invest your disposable income and your disposable time in a product that doesn't give a flying fuck about you. That's fair. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just stop going to games You're aside from the, the random games that I do attend that like I, I'm not even watching really. I'm just getting drunk with friends and, and that's it. That is it. Like, no you guys you do blew this thing. You guys blew this thing and you should feel great amounts of shame about it. And like I, I really hope the because it's all on the at at this point like there's nothing they can do yeah. from a raw. I mean I I know they made eleven moves yesterday, but they were for the most part negligible. Yeah, you want to talk um, about the watch party for the Sox on uh, Sunday? Yeah, in a moment I will get there. Okay. But if uh, like it, it, the players have to like grab their nut sacks and be like, hey, we got a huge hole to dig ourselves out of, and. If they do, awesome. I don't think it's going to happen because the the hole just might – it is too insurmountable. Yeah. 99, 999 times out of 1,000, that – it doesn't matter how 
much talent you have, you're not digging yourself out of the hole they dug themselves into. Mm -hmm. The season's pretty much over. They would have to actually get back to 500 for there to be any hope to making the playoffs. And even then, you're just going to get fucking cream oh. puffed by Houston or Where whoever. Where are you on uh, Lewis Robert? I, he He's done this before. Not like he he's had moments in, in in the past years where he looks like he's so lost at the plate, and then like overnight he'll make an adjustment and then he'll start using all fields again. I was talking and, more about like the oh the, the hustle yanked. thing, yeah. yeah. Like I would have sent his ass to fucking Charlotte if I could have. They couldn't because mm -hmm. they would have had to DFA him. And they're not going to do that, but like I I would have benched him for fucking days for that. And yeah. his, he was lying through his teeth. His hammies were tight. Yeah, they weren't fucking tight. And if they were then you're a complete and total fucking pussy. Yeah. Loosen up. Hit the fucking bike and get loose. Um, Like, if, if it... And I know Pedro's griffle is new. And, like, he... Like, he might not have... The locker room say that, you know, a tenured manager would at this juncture, but, like, I wish he would have just roast, pulled an Ozzy and just went fucking batshit on Robert. Set an example of someone, and I think the easiest way to do that is pick out when a player's not hustling or not hustling. Like, you can control that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's going to be slump sets baseball, but not hustling down the line is something that should never happen. And I would have pulled him out. I would have pulled him out mid-game. I would have sat him the next day, and I would have sat him the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that, and I would have made him earn his way back onto that baseball field through work, you know, behind the scenes, uh, taking BP, and I would have said, "Hey, you want to fucking dog it? Okay, you're on that. You're on the fucking bench right now." I don't know if Robert would care because Robert got paid already, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that, a lot of these extensions that haven't worked out, are. It, very surprising to a lot of people considering that they did nothing but work in years prior with Sale, Quintana, Eaton, Anderson. But these guys all completely fucking – they, they got to grab their balls and, and play better baseball. And the last few days they've done it, but they got to rattle off like a lot in a row. But even if they do make the playoffs, get bounced in the first round again, smoked by a better organization, that's not what we're playing for, Ed. I, I, like, I personally am not rooting for – them to maybe hopefully get to the playoffs every year because what's the point? You're rooting for championships, and that's what they said. Ask me after the parades, plural. They're not holding up their end of the bargain, and Sox fans are furious. I I like I can't watch base, uh, baseball tonight. I don't watch baseball tonight anymore. I can't watch MLB Net. Can't watch pre post game shows. I'll watch them like between innings two and seven right now because there's nothing else to do midweek. And I'll turn them off as soon as they're getting their tits blown off. So it's, sad. it's a sad it... state of affairs in White Sox land right now. Probably doesn't make you happy, but the Cubs are kind of uh, sliding. Oh, that, that's just salt on the – Well, they're well, sputtering they're kind of a little bit. And, uh, yeah, they they, that's going to happen with them. Time, yeah. like they're, they're, the but they're, they play hard, and they play outstanding defense and fundamental baseball, something the White Sox waved bye-bye to prior to me being fucking born. Um, it's it's night and day with those organizations. We're talking about fine guys. You wanted me to talk about Matt Mervis and and uh, who's the other one? Christian Morrell. Yeah, I like, mean, they're, Morrell is like unbelievable. He's at like four hundred. Yeah, they're both fucking destroying the base. Like they're yeah. they're the White Sox don't find guys. They don't develop guys. They do have that have awesome talent. It's it's bad. All like I hate using cliches, but it's just one. It's like a circle. Like, uh, what, uh, what's the Congo or bongo? bongo, like a bongo game. circle of Spider-Man. Like everybody's pointing at everybody Yeah. because everybody's at fault in this. Jerry, Kenny, Rick, Chris Getz and his staff, the players, each and every one of them stands like Jake Berger. He's played great. Um, and, and like the backup guys that are actually trying to earn something like those guys have all played well and it, it, it's bad. Yeah. It's going to take years and years and years to fix, and I don't know how to do it other than just pray to God Jerry Reinsdorf comes to his senses and sells the team, collects his billions, and gives it to someone who will fucking want to win baseball games because it's very clear based on his own words that he doesn't give a shit about that. It's like priority number six on his list. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, so. we could get into um, 
our interview with the doc and talk about another situation with the White Sox that you haven't even mentioned, and that's the injuries. And uh, it was just a fascinating interview overall. We got yeah. into a bunch of uh, injury talk. Mm -hmm. We talked about Zion Williamson. We talked about Al McGinnis. Yeah. Uh, we did a bunch of stuff with the doctor that White Sox Dave is friends with. Um, I'm going to be friends Twitter. with him now, too. Yeah. Just Twitter friends. He reached yeah. out after I'm gonna that ask him about, about. I'm going to ask him about Patrick Kane's hip privately. <laughs> yeah, he he just DM me his number, so I'll give that to you. Um, yeah, really interesting talk. Like I love the the mechanics of athletes, and and the like. I wish I had the brain to go into that field when I was younger. I clearly don't. Not many people do, but um, it, it's super interesting. It's not like a, it's combo that you're not going to hear breaking down from a football coach that is yeah. a meathead. That's you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's more on how the body works and stuff that I am interested in. I hope you guys are too. Yeah. So let's get into it. Before we do, though, let's talk about ChevyDriveChicago.com. Uh, listen, we are giving away a $500 uh, Barstool store gift card. Yep. 500 bucks. That can go a long way in the Barstool store. Could uh, hopefully get you Barstool Chicago merch, but it's not even um, right. necessarily for that. We just got a text about some Father's Day stuff that's fire. Yeah. So you're going to want to get that. Like I, I actually can't wait to get that shirt. Uh, we got some Cubs stuff coming out. Uh, it's almost uh, swim season. I feel like Barcelona Chicago has the best trunks there are. So Agreed. if you go to ChevyDriveChicago.com and sign up to get that $500 gift card, you're going to set up your wardrobe and all your holidays basically for the whole summer. Yeah, and we should say it's ChevyDriveChicago.com slash Barstool. Mm -hmm. So make sure you do that. Enter the sweepstakes. I mean, hey, who knows how many people are in it? So you might have a good chance. So uh, go do that while you're there. Make sure you check out the all-new Chevy lineup and find your local dealer today. You just type in your zip code, and it's as easy as that. One more time, ChevyDriveChicago.com slash Barstool, and you'll be entered in a uh, sweepstakes to win a $500 digital gift card for the Barstool store. Uh, go do it and buy a, a Silverado while you're at it. Um, all right, let's get to uh, Dr. Rick Lehman. Whoosh. Okay, we are in the interview portion of today's show. We are joined by Dr. Rick Lehman of St. Louis. Um, doctor, we had a couple of conversations last week, and um, I want to start by giving you the floor and just kind of uh, letting you explain what it is you do, why you're an expert in um, the sports science, sports medicine, and I'll kind of just give off your background before we get into the meat of the convo. Perfect. So uh, my name is Rick Lehman. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, in short, I've been a team doctor for three NHL teams, the St. Louis Blues, uh, the Florida Panthers, and Tampa Bay, and have taken care of world-class sprinters since 1988, uh, currently taking care of pretty much all of the United States Olympic sprinters, uh, Sidney McLaughlin, uh, Ethan Mew, just uh, Jen Prandini, just, just a whole group with a guy named Bobby Kersey out in L.A., and probably the most of my day or a lot of my day is spent when I'm not in surgery looking at video of injuries. So NFL injuries, um, track and field injuries, making kids run faster, uh, looking at hip rotation and NBA basketball players. So I wouldn't say I'm a basic scientist, but I'm kind of a sports scientist. And these athletes come to us in L.A. and we try to make them run faster, break world records and play hockey. Uh, the best that they can play hockey. So as opposed to just a guy who's going to say, I'm going to fix your ACL or your ulnar collateral ligament, uh, our job is to make you a better athlete and, and, and look at injuries kind of from a 3D analysis to say, how are we going to make you a better D-back? How are we going to make you a better center fielder? What do you have to do to round first base better and not get hurt, et cetera? And uh, so a lot of what you do is preventative, Correct. Absolutely. And, and, and functional performance. So mm -hmm. if you're, if you're going to go to the combine and we can bump you up a 10th of a second, we can make your 40 time a 10th of a second faster. That's probably two, $3 million. Right. So they get sent to us to, to try and promote uh, speed and, and agility. So if we're working with an NFL guy, obviously a 40 times, a big thing, shuttle drills, uh, vertical. So, so more performance. So we started speaking last week. Um, I wrote that blog on the tank, um, uh, Gervonta Davis for, versus uh, Garcia boxing match and, and the liver shot that he took. Can you just give a quick two minute uh, breakdown of that body shot and why it was so, I don't know, diabolical, if you will? 
<laughs> well, I think anytime you get hit in the liver, as we, as we talked about, you get a few things that happen. Number one, your vagus nerve, which is the nerve that innervates your diaphragm and kind of the, the parts of your chest gets stunned. So you, you can imagine if you dinged your funny bone and all your fingers went numb or you had dead arm syndrome, you're a baseball player, you got dead arm syndrome, your arm's not going to work, then that is a devastating injury. You also get a vascular problem and then you have pain that's unremitting. So truly, you see mostly liver shots in MMA. A guy gets kicked to the liver, match is over, nothing you can do. You can't breathe. You can't elevate your diaphragm. You have a central nervous system shock and you're, you're out. In, in that liver punch, it was interesting because he stepped back. It looked like he could keep going. But as soon as I saw the punch, I said, this fight's over. There's just no chance. And, and it was funny because like the meathead in me, I wanted to see someone, you know, snot flying out of their nose, spitting blood everywhere and out cold. But you broke when you broke it down to me in DMs, it was it was really cool to like learn the science of it. And um, on that note, I do want to shift to we did talk about Darnell Wright, the Bears first round pick. Um, I'm like since the NFL draft is in April. Every year I I'm in baseball mode, so I follow it kind of from a distance I know the first round guys for the most part the guys that I follow from the colleges that I watch every weekend and You had nothing but praise for Darnell Wright from a mechanical standpoint from you know The science behind what makes him great. Can you uh, break him down a little bit for us? Well, you know, it's interesting when you look at a football player and I think everybody wants to downplay the mental part of football and, and that's that's a mistake so when you look at guys that are that are great football players, they can tell you where everybody is. And no different than hockey. You can talk to Wayne Gretzky, who I treated and talked to, and he would tell you, you know, I remember this goal and this winger was here and Brett Hall was there. And 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 so great football players are also pretty smart. They they know everything going on in the field. Then you get the guy who's just got unbelievable talent. And what does that mean? That means flexibility in their hips. That means 40 times. I mean, this is a big guy. He runs fast. He has unbelievable body control. And when you put him, if you film him and you put him in a 3D motion analysis and you see the stuff he can do, it's crazy. I mean, he has unbelievable control of his upper body. He's got flexibility in his lumbar spine. And so he's going to be able to physically do things that most people can't do. So if you're Usain Bolt, you can just run faster than everybody. And, and some athletes just have an ability to do things biomechanically with their body that put them in an unbelievable uh, advantage position. Now, if he can learn all the stuff he needs to learn and in his position, he should be able to, he's going to be a great talent. The bears got a great pick. Now someone might say, Hey, you should have drafted a quarterback or, I mean, you can always make a criticism, but from a biomechanical standpoint of view, you know, if you send this guy to us and we break down what he can do and what we would want to work on, he is starting out 200 yards ahead of everybody else. Is there anything you would work on with him from your eyes? Uh, good question. Is vertical and 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 for for alignment that's important. And he looks to me like he can gain some mid trunk strength or some glute strength in, in a first. So he's got great hip rotation and he's got good side to side. But if you think about alignment, their whole world is six inches in front of them right? The first thing you're going to do is six inches in front of you. So, in, in, and they'll work on that. They'll work on that push off. But other than that, I mean, th this is the full package. And I think it was a great pick. What, why do you think the vertical is so important for alignment? I've never heard. I was going to say, say that because you just mentioned functional strength and functional movements and you don't see a O lineman ever jump, you know? Well, that, that's not, a, that, 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 that's true. But, but just think about, as your vertical gets better, what gets better? Your butt, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you get up in the air? It's your butt. And and if you're going to push some guy who also weighs 340 pounds in front of you or stop them from pushing you, where's that coming from? That's coming from your butt. So a lot of people wouldn't work on vertical as an uh, offensive lineman. What's this guy need to jump for? And and that's true. He's not, you know, unless he's going to play a one-on-one -on, -one on basketball, that's right. But if you want to strengthen his ability to move forward, and generate torque in his mid core that's where you got to go because no one's worked on his mm -hmm. i promise you no one has ever said to this kid I, mean, I don't know if he's ever had his vertical measured what's your vertical and if we can get you another six inches what does that mean for your ability to push off the line and that's where you're going to gain glute strength or what we call mid core trunk strength now i i've also heard people describe down darnell wright as having heavy hands 
<laughs> where does that come from? And is that something that you see as a doctor when you're watching a guy move? You send these 3D uh, analysis. Is that like, oh, he has like this sort of hip rotation or, or, or shoulder rotation that allows him to have that? Like, how does how can you see that easily on, on tape? Well, you see it on tape and, and, and you see it with his ability to, to, to move um, defensive, whoever, you know, guards, whoever. And, and and position his hands in such a way that that he is able to to generate um, movement forward and 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 move uh, the defense where he wants to move the defense, keep the defense from getting past him essentially. And when you watch him on tape, again, great hip rotation, great shoulder rotation. And if you think about an offensive lineman, what's he got to do? He's got to get his body in position. And then when, when that defensive, whoever is going by him, he has to be able to rotate and move that body out of the way. And I think he does that very well. Again, as he gets stronger in that, in that anterior posterior direction, you're going to see him be able to improve upon that. Because again, you're going from Tennessee to the big boys. Everybody's fast. Everybody's strong, you know, the best of the best. So, all of a sudden, what he could do in Tennessee, it's not going to be so easy in the NFL. And they'll work on just what you're talking about and that shoulder rotation and that strength, that's pec strength, and that's what we call scapular stabilizer strength, how strong those muscles are that hold your shoulder blade to your chest wall. And he's got it, they'll, and they'll develop that. And, like, I, over the – I was – shocked by the pick when they made it. I'll, I'll be the first to admit, but I had conversations with friends that um, they played at Northwestern with P Peter Skaronsky, who was drafted, I think it was immediately after him, right at 11. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted the homegrown kid, but everything that you've said and what they have told me too, and they're like, hey, you can't go wrong with this pick. Like, it's Skaronsky is awesome. He's a, he's going to be a 10-year star in the NFL. Same with this Darnell Wright kid. Just trust us on this. If the Bears go there, they didn't make a wrong pick. We want Pete there too, but that's not a bad pick. But you you have talked me into it even more over the last week or two. But I do want to shift to the White Sox, which is what started. Um, well, it was it was at the start of our conversations and why they are so oft injured. And uh, you said you broke down. I think it was Eloy and Mankata, um, maybe a few other guys. But um, what do you see from from your eyes? Why are they always injured? You know, I, I think injuries, there's two reasons kids get injured. One reason is they get injured because it gets a bad luck. You know, you slide in the base, mm -hmm. what, you hit with a push in the head, whatever, you get bad luck. And then some of it's very predictable. It's imbalance. It's flexibility. So, you know, let's take Mankata, for instance. He had a rib injury, and now he's got a back injury. Now he's got chronic back problems. And if you knew that these were factors, let's say it was your back, and, and, and you knew you had this problem, when you were better, what would you do? You would strengthen your back, you would look at your anterior posterior balance, and you'd do all the things that are available to you to avoid having a problem. So if your tire was going flat every day, you wouldn't wait for it to go flat, you put air in it in, 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 in anticipation that you gotta get you know to the, to the radio station or wherever. So I think you have to really look, like when I was a team doctor for the Florida Panthers and the Blues, we would go through the summer and we would have a killer summer program. We would look for them um, at the beginning of summer, midsummer afterwards. And we really nailed our miss man games almost to nothing because we knew they were going to have hip flexor injuries. We knew that they were going to have shoulder injuries and guys that already had injuries or had a weakness. We just drilled down and we worked like they were injured, even though they weren't injured. And that's how you prevent injuries. So if you know, someone's got a weakness and you just nail that, you know that when the season comes up, they've already been working on that, and and you're up way ahead of the curve. So I just don't know if their biomechanics. And again, I'm not critical of anybody in the White Sox organization, but I'm I just wonder if someone's not looking at these kids from a biomechanical standpoint and say, look, you had a rib injury. What's the next thing that's going to happen? Well, I promise you, the next thing that's going to happen is a back injury. That just has to be. And so you can almost see that coming. And if you could see, if I could see that coming, and you know, that's something you want to get ahead of. And so some of these injuries, I think these soft tissue injuries, these hamstring injuries, these chronic issues, you almost have to have a very good assessment, look for hip, hip flexor, um, flexibility, look at mid trunk strength, look at alignment, do your motion analysis, and then say, hey, we're going to treat you like you're hurt, 
And and if we do that, you're not going to get hurt. And, and I just don't see that. <clears throat> so I, I know you're not going to throw any of your colleagues under the bus at all. You even said it yourself just now. But like, is is there a disconnect from player to training staff? Um, I mean, when you worked with the Blues or, or the Panthers, um, did certain players were they soft or was it just you already said some players just are injury prone for whatever reason or is it a a, a, a organizational dysfunction with them it's a great question that's a great question so you know athletes are tough i mean i can't tell you how many athlete cardinal baseball players you know you would just say hey that guy's a knucklehead he's just not listening mm-hmm. he's just not doing the things that he needs to do you know, and, and I'll give you a perfect example. Um, guys coming into training camp, Grant Fuhr coming into training camp, 20, 30 pounds overweight. Or uh, I, I, I can name you so many athletes that we've taken care of that that show up and they're just not in shape. And then you get a guy like Aeneas Williams who shows up and he looks like he could just run through the wall day one. So what's the difference? Some people are following the program. They're doing all the right stuff. And, and, and then some of it is the training staff just not giving them that information. But if they're giving them that information, you got to take that information and do all mm-hmm. the right things. So everyone, you know, talks about Roger Clemens off season and this one's off season, that one's off season. No one talks about the guy that didn't do anything off season, you know, ate a bunch of Doritos and just got bigger and didn't really work out and showed up hoping to get into shape. That's not sports today. Sports today is you show up at spring training, you're ready to rock. You're not playing yourself into shape. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yes, maybe the training staff isn't a hundred percent on it or maybe they're on it. And, and the athletes just, you know, are going home. It's the off season. Maybe they're playing some summer ball and they're just not doing the things they need to do. These things are boring. These exercises, they're tedious. You got to do them every day. And you're saying to yourself, hey, my hamstring doesn't hurt or my back doesn't hurt. Why am I doing these exercises? But then, you know, 30 games in, you're on the DL and you say to yourself, you know, I should have did those exercises. Mm -hmm. It's I like I, I always was of the opinion that, you know, the White Sox are a major league baseball organization, a professional sports franchise. They their team doctors are every bit as qualified to diagnose and and prevent injuries. Um, get these guys back from injuries when they do occur. And I have given them every single benefit of the doubt. And every single time someone gets hurt on the White Sox, it's like, we need to fire the train staff. We need to fire. I'm like, what, like, what can the White Sox possibly do to prevent? Like these guys, they just pull their hamstrings a lot. Is that like they're, they have to be giving them that information and, and the workout regimens and all that stuff to, to avoid these, you know, it's three years, four years in a row now where everybody gets hurt, everybody. Mm-hmm. And I mean, now I guess I got to change my tune on that a little bit. I mean, at least consider the other side, which I never did before. But I know Ryan has a, a lot of similar questions about the Nottingham Force. I just talked to you about it a few minutes ago. Yeah, it's first. I, I, it sounds like you would have worked with uh, Al McKinnis based on uh, the other players that you mentioned. Is that accurate? Very accurate. Okay. So when you look, he, Al McKinnis is known as having maybe the hardest slap shot ever, especially given his era where he was using a, a wood stick for a lot of that. Is there something that when you evaluate him, where he is, how much of that is he's a physical freak versus he is uh, rotating his body or doing something in a biomechanical fashion that allows him uh, to shoot the puck like that? And if that is, if it's more the latter, how come you can't teach that to other people? Well, you know, you're, 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 you're right in my wheelhouse here. This is beautiful. So Al McKinnis, first of all, is the hardest worker. If you said, Al, do this, Al's going to do this, right? Mm-hmm. He's not partying. He's, he's, he's doing what you tell him, number one. Number two, there's no question, just like speed, throwing a baseball. How can a guy throw 100 miles an hour and I can't throw 60 miles an hour? You know, I've been ripped off. What's the deal here? And Al certainly has the biomechanics and and maybe freak is the right word you know bjorn borg running sideways faster than anybody else ever you know why is that it's just it's just you're born that way so i think al had an unbelievable talent al already also had an unbelievable work ethic and so when you look at guys with that combination and you know the the tiger woods or roger federer you can go down the list roger clements you know them all um that that creates something that no one else can do so i think that 
trying to teach somebody to do something is like saying, okay, I'm going to teach uh, Chief here to throw a hundred mile per hour fastball. You could, you could train all you want. You mm-hmm. could train 10 hours a day, the rest of your life. You're never going to be able to throw a hundred mile per hour fastball because you don't have the biomechanics to do it. So some of that's God given just like, how does somebody run a four four forty one four three forty? You can practice all you want. It's it's not going to help you. And so I think from a standpoint of some athletes, they're just born with an ability. Now what you can teach is technique, and you can greatly improve upon their slap shot, the speed of the slap shot, their ability to direct the puck, or the speed of a fastball. And you can teach someone to pitch, but you can't teach someone to throw that mm-hmm. much harder. So if you're getting, let's just say on average that you're getting an athlete, we'll we'll call it a pitcher, so it makes sense for for the broader audience. And you're like, hey, like I can, can you get someone three to five miles per hour? I was just going to ask, can like you get that? me up to like you know ninety? <laughs> All day long. All day long. All day long. You'll get you'll get five. You'll get three. You'll get seven, maybe. Wow. All day long. So that's that's really, if, you, if you had met this guy twenty years ago, you, I would have had a yeah, I would have had. You wouldn't a 50, be sitting here. No, I wouldn't You'd be, be on the DL for the White Sox. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, how long would something like that take? Out of curiosity, like if I if I joined the Doctor Layman House of Throwing, like I could, I think I could hit eighty pretty comfortably off a mound right now. Um, so right now we we probably get you to eighty five, eighty six. It'd probably take us ten weeks, twelve weeks. So a winner. There's no question. Yeah. Now, could you get 90 that I doubt it, you know, but, but you, you, you probably can get seven to 8%. I mean, that's what the number is. And, and we've done this on a repeated basis, just like we'll take a kid who, who runs a four, six, four, six, five, 40, and, and they'll run a four, five, four, 40. And we can do this consistently. Can we get them to a four, three, 40? Can they beat Deion Sanders in a day? No, that's not going to happen. But can they bump up 10%? Yeah, you can get 10%. Okay, now I do want to do my Nottingham yeah, Forest yeah. question before we let you go. They have lost more man games uh, than any other team in the Premier League this year, and it's essentially, I would say, like 90% of the injuries are these soft tissues, and almost all of those are groin and hamstring, and they had to bring in an entire new roster this year. And I, I got curious, and I'm like, are these, have these guys been injury-prone in other stops, in Germany, other places in England, et cetera? And the answer is unequivocally no. So something happened with Notty- with these guys coming to Nottingham Forest this year where they all seem to have like the same hamstring issue that costs them in some cases 12 weeks. So how 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 can you explain that has to be on the training staff of the organization the correct denominator? No question. So so let's get back to the the White Sox and let's kind of tie this in a little bit. If you take a if you take one guy, so the trainer's busy, the doctors are doing what doctors do, Tommy John's, ACLs, whatever we do, and you take one guy and he's a biomechanics expert and he says, Look, I'm gonna spend twenty five minutes with every one of your athletes and we're gonna look at muscle imbalance, we're gonna look at three D mo there's a there's a technique called uplift, which is two ninety ninety iPads that give you an unbelievable amount of biomechanical information. And we're gonna do this for every athlete, which makes total sense right if you have a ferrari you're going to take it to the best guy so and 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 you're going to image these guys and put the time in you're going to be able to decrease your missed man games and you're going to be able to get rid of most of the soft tissue injuries you can't get rid of the guy who gets slid into and breaks his leg right but you can't get rid of the guy that pulls his groin gets an oblique has a hammy has a hip flexor you got the same thing in forest nottingham you got something going on with the training staff they're just not on it they're not looking at muscle imbalance their training regimen is off so if i said hey i'm going to give you a 20 pound weight and i want you to throw it like a baseball you said well my elbow's sore i would say of course that's a dumb thing to do so they're doing something a wrong and b not right so what's happening is these guys are getting hurt and hurt and hurt and and knowing the premier league pretty well and knowing soccer pretty well i can tell you their injuries are off the chart. And so in there, maybe maybe a, a more egregious than what you're talking about at the White Sox, there's a failure there. Mm-hmm. But I think in these high-level organizations, you, got it, you need someone who can specifically look at just biomechanics, injury patterns, and, and maybe the doctor, the training staff, doesn't have the time for the White Sox or 
any specific team. And if it's, and if they don't, you got to hire that guy because yeah. so let's say that guy's a hundred grand a year, and what's your payroll? And what, what's a Miss Man game cost? So it really yeah. is money. And I think you just have to be attention to detail to understand, hey, each athlete's different. This is his prone problem. He's had this problem, you know, before, or he hasn't had this problem before. This is his imbalance. And we're going to treat this going into the season knowing that this is a potential. It's just math. Is there a 20% chance he's going to pull? Is there a 50% chance he's going to pull? And how are we going to treat that so he doesn't pull? And I think the White Sox could do it. It's just a matter of doing it. Do you got a uh, um, a number where you would drop everything and be the become the White Sox head athletic trainer? Because <laughs> I will get that to them because they need to. I mean, Tim Anderson <laughs> usually is pulling muscles. This one was a contact injury. So, but like Mikata, Eloy's been out already. Top three guys in their farm system all hurt. Um, Robert's probably due for one because he always he hasn't had one yet and he's always due, you know. Um his got, hamstrings were a, tight on Saturday. Night. I yeah, got a couple were, quick questions. Uh to switch the NBA real quick, I think one of the most interesting stories is a curious case of Zion Williamson. Do you ever expect him to play a full year? And uh I, I watched a YouTube video on his gait. You said you study NBA injuries and it was it was fascinating about the whole gait and how you walk factors into being injured and whatnot how much have you uh looked into zion's case so zion you know when he was at duke i mean he he's a phenom he's a guy that probably can't stay healthy in the nba for for a number of reasons pronated feet uh significant overload um and and he's not a guy who who decelerates well so if you think about you're going to jump up in the air you're going to come down and and how you decelerate determines how much stress you dissipate in your lower extremities. And he's a guy that just, you know, had, had, doesn't have good biomechanics. Now, could you take him and, and train him? Um, you know, that maybe, but this is a big guy that has inherent issues, uh, with his foot mechanics and ankle mechanics, number one, and his size, number two, if I were, you know, one on one with this guy, I'd have him probably lose about 30, 40 pounds, uh, which wouldn't be a popular thing to do. And and we would put him we would talk about lower extremity biomechanics, landing patterns. We would get a force plate and see if we could decrease his force analysis when he lands. And we would look at um, basically putting more stress in his mid trunk, less stress in, in his lower extremities. But, you know, that's that's a project for a guy that big, number one, and who's been chronically injured since his NBA career started. So, again, that and you're right. It, it all starts with the gait. It starts with the biomechanics of the hips, rotation of the hips. And right now, um, that's a project that's tough because he's a big guy and he has he has poor landing mechanics. And, th- and then my other thing was obviously Chicago related as well. Uh, Lonzo Ball is uh in a, in a pretty terrible situation i don't know how much you followed that but uh can we ever expect him to be back to the level he was can we ever expect him to play again i don't i don't know what you followed on that he's another guy you know i i wouldn't say it's genetic a component of it is um chronically hurt um you know uh, no, no timetable for him to return. Um, I think that's a tough ticket. I think he's a guy that potentially uh, could come back. It's going to take probably six months, and and whether he can stay healthy, that that's another project. You know, some people just don't have the biomechanics for the sport that they're playing, even though they have a lot of talent. And he's a guy that I just don't know that, that can stay healthy. And you see these guys in in every sport, guys that have unbelievable talent, but then just they get hurt and then they're hurt and then they come back and they're, they're back for a little bit, but you know, they revert back to the same problem. And that is, you know, their tires just aren't aligned. And I think Lonzo ball falls perfectly into that category. Yeah. I'll, I'll end on these two questions unless there are more questions are bred from your answers here. But, um, are <laughs> How much there, time you got? <laughs> I, well, this is, I love this combo that we're having. Yeah, me too. Are there, um, are there any? Uh, we'll we'll stick to football for this one. Are there anybody? Is, were there any draft picks in the first, second round, or whatever that you targeted? And you're like, I wouldn't have taken that guy in spite of what he could bre- project to be without injury. 
in the first round, no. I, 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 I don't I don't think there was anybody I would look at and say, um, wow, you know, this 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 is a uh, a disaster. Um, the, the, the one issue I, I maybe had was with with the Ohio State quarterback. I, I, don't, I don't know that he's he's a guy that 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 is going to uh, um, produce like like everybody hopes he produces I hope he does but um, you know I think I think the, the the issues always are breakdown in the joint cartilage injuries in the joint etc and uh, I, I there's nobody I would look at and I would say for sure hey this 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 is a, a biomechanical mess this is a big problem hmm. and my last question is this in light of Ed bringing up Zion Williamson, is there such thing as being just too athletic that like your body, your, your athleticism is more advanced than science or like your, more your advanced. tendons can't contain your explosion yeah, kind of right. Thing? Absolutely. And, and you, you see that, you know, you see that in, in the NFL, you see guys that are, that, that their, their abilities um, are beyond what, what their, what their ligamentous structure can can um, support. So you, you you'll see guys that 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 have um, forty times, and you know they're going to break down. Or you see guys that 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 are just their, their athletic ability. So let's say you decided you wanted to rappel off your roof ten times, and you could do it. And there's guys that could do it. Um, at this time, uh, you know what would happen? Well, you would break down your joint. So so just because people could do it doesn't mean that they should do it. And um, I think I think you, you see athletes that you know are going to break down, that are going to tear their biceps, they're going to tear their pecs, just because their strength is so um, – their, their flexibility and their strength is so beyond that they're just unable to contain that stress. So, so you know, along those same lines, can we predict who's going to tear their ACL? Not at 100%, but we have technology that, that that's pretty good about that. And if you take a guy with – that's just massive, huge quads, huge torque on their ACL, and unbelievable hip rotation. That combination is going to increase your chance to tear in your ACL. So in that case, your your, your athletic ability, which what's what makes you a great athlete, is also going to make you more prone to having meniscal injury and ACL injury, et cetera. And I think the biggest thing that we don't talk, we haven't talked about a little bit, Brandon Hughes, but we haven't talked about is what happens when that cartilage breaks down. And that's what's killing a lot of the NBA guys. And that's what's killing a lot of pro athletes is that, you know, they get scoped in college or in high school. They have a little bit of wear in their joint. No one's really after maintaining the strength and, and understanding their imbalances. So then they have another scope, a little bit more damage of the cartilage. And the next thing you know, they got an area, they're bone on bone. Um, and then the next thing, you know, they got an arthritic knee and D rose. You can go down the mm -hmm. list of guys like this. And I think that's the biggest thing that you have to look for. So when you ask your question about the draft, it's not so much, hey, that's a guy who they shouldn't have drafted. You just got to make sure that those joints uh, are not prone to break down. And, and, you know, again, that gets back to the biomechanics. All right. Last, last question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> It, it, with respect to that, what do you make of like the TB12 method, which is, you know, my understanding of it is like low impact flexibility, um, things like that, where he's just he doesn't really do the weightlifting as much. He's kind of against weightlifting a, as an injury prevention, long, longevity um, system. What, what, do you buy into that? Well, first, first of all, I think the concept is correct. And what's the concept? The concept is you want to have significant flexibility and decrease the amount of stress on your joints, right? So the more flexible your joint is, not to the point of instability, but flexibility, the less stress there is in your joint. And then, and then getting back to just what we were talking about a little bit is if, if, if you have less torque on your joint, then there's less stress on the cartilage. So you're whatever you're you're a center fielder you weigh 245 you have seven percent body fat and you're just muscle all that muscle is putting significant torque on your knee so the tb12 basically is looking at flexibility and trying to decrease the load in the joint you know yoga pilates all these things that 
maybe we laugh at a little bit, but are unbelievably effective. And so if you can make that athlete and, and, and getting back to your question of, you know, are athletes too athletic for their bodies? If you can increase their flexibility, decrease the stress on their joint, you're going to limit the number of people that have this degenerative pattern we were just talking about. And again, you guys didn't mention Brandon Hughes, but I did. But but does he have a bone on bone problem that that can't you can't really fix? And I think I think Tom's general pattern of understanding is is 100% correct. I'm not a fan of his diet, but I think the training, not trying to bulk up and not trying to get so muscular that all the torque on the joint is breaking down the cartilage is a great concept. And when you look at some guys, and, and more, I'm going to bring up Marshall Falk, a friend. You, you wouldn't look at that guy and go, oh, my gosh, that's just a ripped up specimen. You would say he just looks like the rest of us. You know, he's not real tall. He doesn't got crazy muscles. But he's got great flexibility, got great vision. His first step is unbelievable. His rotation is unbelievable. And if you can rip, replicate that, then I think you're going to have a lot fewer injuries, number one, and you're going to have less joint stress on the cartilage. And, and, and I think that's what, what the TB12 kind of focuses on. So I'm kind of I'm a fan of the concept. Some of the stuff's a little wacky. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the flexibility and the biomechanics, I think we need to focus more on that than just getting in the gym and getting you ripped up for no, for no end game. What, what's the end game there? Uh, uh, that's I, I've loved this conversation. Yeah, I feel this has like been it, fantastic. Yeah, like I learned a lot, and I thought that was great. So, uh, I, anybody else who we just want to let, let him get back to his patience and his yeah, day, right? <laughs> well, it sounds it like again. you're doing the media rounds a little bit right now. I saw you were on uh, ESPN St. Louis down there today, right? Or it's coming up after yeah. this? Yeah. So we appreciate you coming on, Doc. I will be blowing you up, I'm sure, plenty now that we are internet friends. So, like a Twitter or anything, you want to get out there? Is it? Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Follow, you know, follow me on Twitter. You guys, you guys, we kick it back to you. We hashtag you guys, and you know what? It's really fun. I mean, when when you're seeing patients all day and everything's a major decision, to do a little media is a blast. And you guys obviously are uh, you figured it out. So, you know, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram, and anything I can do. What it, shout out that that Twitter real quick. We can throw a graphic uh, on, on there too. What is our Twitter account? <laughs> Yours Dr. is just Rick. at Dr. Rick Lehman. Yeah, that's pretty easy, huh? Yep, nice and easy. All right, Doc, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you it, Doc. That was a great convo. One. People are going to love that, and I learned a ton. So so thank you. All right, we're back. Um, thanks to the Doc for coming on. Uh, we could kind of just put a bow on this show now. Um, a couple quick notes, a couple weeks guests. Couple our guest a couple weeks ago, Brian Urlacher, his kid Kennedy, yeah, committed at Notre Dame. So Notre congratulations Dame. to him. Yep, that's exciting. Yeah, so we'll hang out on the sidelines with our friend Brian when he gets yeah. there. So uh, that'll be good. A couple of restore boys, yeah, mm-hmm. on the go. sidelines for Notre Dame. I'm there a restore go. athlete. Yeah, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so I'm that'll not. be good. And then hopefully soon. Monday, you're having a party. Monday, we will be at Barstool Dang. River North. It, that is, it's like uh, uh, arguably like. That's going to be like the most stressful day I've had in like years because Forrest has a uh, game where if they don't win, they're done. Uh, that's at two o'clock. We got the draft lottery, which will determine the next decade for the Blackhawks and what their ceiling is. That's at seven o'clock. Then uh, we have a dozen match at eight, and that determines and that if that determines if we if make the, the, the tournament or not. <laughs> so it's it is it is like just a, a twelve hour stretch at do or die for your boy. You guys need to win that so I can go back to New York one last time. I don't think that you're invited regardless. <laughs> I'm invited. I was on okay. the list. All right. Um, you but can't come with me? No, you're not Team Chicago, dude. You're a different brand. Eddie wants his own with personal all social media fans. manager. I mean, I'm an MVP candidate. I should get one. Yeah, that's kind of Hey, true. I will go with you. Just convince him. So, you, yeah. So, it, this is we, we got to get it done, Dave. So make sure you got your your uh, music guy calling on speed dial, mm-hmm. and, uh, and he's we'll, good. We'll see if we can get, Sneak our, one get out. ourselves into uh, the tournament. I do want to head out there one run. last time for a couple of days because when we were out there last, time, you love New York. I'm going no, to not... get you one of those. I, like, I do want to go to John's Bleaker. That, that just says I love New York. I heart New York. I do want to go to John's Bleaker one last time. I love get that we're act- steak dinner. Love that we're acting like it's washing away into the Hudson. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's could never go there again. Yeah. If it did, I wouldn't hate it. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's on. just like no. I'm joking. Eight million people dead, but okay. That's fucked up. 
Genocide sucks, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, White Sox Adolf. <laughs> yeah, that's fucked up, Dave. Uh, yeah, so we'll see. Big, big Monday for your boy, Chief. Yeah. Big Monday. And on Sunday, Ed, where are you and I going to be? I you, This is your thing. I may go. I'm not a lock on this invitation, but you're going to be at Aurora. You Hollywood are a lock Casino. on this invitation. It's not true. Don't listen to you, me. I just invited you. you have so. to, Eddie has to go there to do social. I have a, my nephew's baptism. Oh. Well, that sounds like a great job for Hannah. Hannah and Dave, <laughs> two best friends that anyone could have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, go check out that, though, as well, if you're in the Aurora Yeah, area. so that it's going to be at the Hollywood Casino in Aurora, my home casino. Go there Thanksgiving, Christmas tradition with myself and my father. Um, we are going to be gambling a little bit, you know, throwing it back a few drinks. It's to watch the White Sox game. And up until the seventh inning stretch, uh, we are going to be talking uh, or talking. We're going to be um, taking entrance for uh, May 20th, which is a Saturday. Um, we're uh, 10. It's 10 contestants win two tickets to a suite we have where it's all you can eat and drink parking will be included um so you won't have to be giving any of your personal money to jerry reinsdorf and his uh lps so i think that's reason enough to head out to aurora and uh win some money on the craft table blackjack like table and you uh, stop at house actually we are uh, that go. is something that i am going to plan ahead for it's not anymore uh we're good close Great. on sundays is it i don't know it is. You, you told me that before. A lot, of, a lot of the year it is. I don't think it is right now, though. Really? Right. Um, all right. Thanks again to the doc. Thanks again to Brandon Thorne. Uh, go check them out. And, uh, yeah, a heavy sports mid-show today. Uh, felt good. Yeah. Felt good. Throwback red line. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. We will be back on Tuesday. We will see you then.